This decon area setup course focuses on the practical theory behind setting up the various components of your decon area in the safest and most efficient manner regardless of its location or type of decontamination equipment used. Setting up the decon area requires coordination of multiple pieces of equipment, supplies and resources orchestrated in a manner that maximizes staff safety and speed of victim care. The setup principles are applicable to any type of incident regardless of the nature of the event or the number of victims and responding personnel. Establishing the decon area is the responsibility of the equipment support function of the incident command system. Equipment support does not require any special personal protective equipment. Their tasks should be concluded before any patients or hazardous substances are introduced into the system. Like all unprotected persons, they will be restricted from entering the area after patients arrive. In this program, an outdoor portable decontamination system will be used to demonstrate the proper process of setting up the decon area. The principles discussed are directly applicable to all types of decontamination systems, including portable shelters or enclosures, mobile trailers, and fixed facilities. Standardization of the setup allows for uniform and safe response independent of make or style of the decontamination equipment. Equipment support's first task is to attend the pre-incident briefing where the decon unit leader instructs them how the decon area is to be configured. It should be set up in a fashion that is consistent with the anticipated mobility level of the arriving patients. Contaminated victims will present to the hospital in three fashions. In multiple patient incidents, a combination of presentations may occur. Ambulatory casualties are the most common, so the decon area setup should reflect a more do-it-yourself environment. Non-ambulatory victims require more hands-on care, which should be reflected in the setup. These patients must have equipment that is able to support and contain a backboard or stretcher. The setup for semi-ambulatory patients is somewhere in between. The decon area is a secured location where all facets of the emergency decontamination operation occur. It is conceptually divided into two zones that demarcate the level of contamination anticipated and the patient care activities to be performed. These two functional zones include the hospital decontamination zone and the hospital post-decontamination zone. The hospital decontamination zone includes any areas where the type and quantity of a hazardous substance is unknown and where contaminated victims, equipment, or waste may be present. As a result, exposure risk to staff working in this zone is elevated, requiring the institution and enforcement of defensive measures, including the use of personal protective equipment. In the hospital decontamination zone, a number of activities take place, including but not limited to initial triage, medical stabilization, victim and equipment staging, patient clothing removal, decontamination, and post-decontamination victim inspection. This zone typically ends near the emergency department entrance. The hospital post-decontamination zone is an area considered uncontaminated. In most circumstances, this zone includes the emergency department where decontaminated patients are evaluated and treated. If the emergency department becomes contaminated, then all staff working in this area should use similar personal protective equipment that was used in the hospital decontamination zone. For planning purposes, the hospital decontamination zone is typically divided into three distinct areas, commonly referred to as the warm end, the cold end, and the decon corridor. The term warm implies a higher likelihood for the presence of a hazardous substance while cold infers that the area is clean and free of hazard. Regardless of the terms used to demarcate the areas, access to the hospital decontamination zone should be limited to decon team members and contaminated victims until the operation has concluded and the area has been cleaned up. The warm end is the area where contaminated patients are staged. 
it should be away from normal patient traffic flow, in a location that can be secured, and where clothing removal and triage can be accomplished. This area is restricted to contaminated persons and designate staff and appropriate personal protective equipment. The cold end of the hospital decontamination zone functions as a post-decon triage area. Personnel stationed at the cold end do not require advanced chemical protective clothing or a respirator. Standard precautions attire is typically adequate. The decon corridor serves as a passageway connecting the warm and cold ends of the hospital decontamination zone. It is the actual location within the zone where decontamination equipment is set up and soap and water showering occurs. At the warm end of the decon corridor, patients enter the showering process, and on the cold end of the corridor, patients exit decontamination. The decon corridor also has two sides. The dirty side is where all ancillary equipment used in the decontamination process should be placed after use. It can also refer to the side of the decon corridor where overspray typically goes. The clean side is the side kept free of obstruction so decon team members can function and move more freely while avoiding overspray contaminating their PPE. Not everybody presenting to the hospital decontamination zone requires soap and water showering. In some circumstances, clothing removal alone will provide adequate decontamination. For these situations, a secured corridor for clothing removal only will control patient movement from the hospital decontamination zone to the post-decontamination zone. A ground tarp is often a good start to establishing the decon corridor. The tarp shows the perimeter of the decon corridor and protects the bottom of the decontamination equipment. It also helps identify the logical flow from entry to exit and clean and dirty sides of the decon corridor. The tarp should be large enough to extend beyond the edge of the portable decontamination equipment or shelter. It should be placed on a relatively flat surface such as a parking lot or sidewalk. Weighted objects such as traffic cones can be used as needed to secure the ground tarp and keep it in place. Windy conditions may make it necessary to fold the tarp and restrict its use to protecting the bottom of the decontamination equipment. The next task is to position a collection pool on the ground tarp toward the warm slash dirty side. The collection pool retains the runoff from the showering process until it can be pumped into a wastewater collection container, such as a 55-gallon drum or flexible holding tank as necessary. State and federal regulations require recovery and proper disposal of wastewater generated by non-emergency decontamination operations. The facility should make reasonable attempts to collect the runoff even during emergency decontamination operations. Elevated platforms should be placed inside the pool to keep the patient out of the wastewater. These platforms must be strong enough to hold a standing and walking patient, to support a chair for the semi-ambulatory patient, and to accommodate a patient on a backboard. The next task is to assemble all components of the decontamination system following manufacturer's instructions. Be certain to place all utilities such as hoses and extension cords on the dirty side of the corridor. Place a soap dispenser and brushes within easy reach of the patient. The soap should be liquid, non-abrasive, and without any perfumes or additives. The brush should have a long handle so the patient can reach all body areas and the bristles should be soft to prevent irritating or damaging the skin. Systems should be in place to dry and provide privacy to victims exiting decon at the cold end. There should be buckets with a sanitizing product in them and trauma shears in case clothing needs to be cut off of non-ambulatory patients. You should test the equipment after it is fully assembled. Turn the water on to make sure that sufficient pressure and flow are available and to ensure that all shower heads are correctly aimed and working properly. Also, make certain temperature is adjusted to provide warm water whenever possible. 
This water does not need to be pumped into the wastewater collection container. Place a wastewater pump, whether electric or manual, in the collection pool at the lowest point on the dirty side of the decon corridor. This pump is used to evacuate contaminated water into a wastewater collection container. If an electric pump is used, its electric cord should enter on the dirty side to avoid creating a trip hazard. Anytime you use electricity around water, safety precautions such as using GFCI outlets must be met. Steps such as turning the water off between victims can be taken to minimize the amount of clean water that is pumped into the wastewater collection containers. Place solid waste collection containers along the dirty side to collect refuse. Position container number one so the patient can deposit their contaminated clothing and any gowns they use to cover them prior to decontamination. Collect all the dirty towels and other items used during the decontamination process in container number two. Use container number three to collect the decon team's disposable personal protective equipment. These containers should be closable to suppress the release of any vapors. Use as many containers as necessary, but try to keep them on the dirty side of the decon corridor. When the decon corridor is established in this order, it is possible to evacuate all unprotected personnel and allow patients to enter the shower before the corridor is completely assembled. Designated decon team members wearing protective gear can add pumps and solid waste collection containers later. Once the decon corridor has been readied, equipment support monitors all utilities and stands by to assist the decon unit leader as needed. Many times utilities are regulated remotely. For example, water can be turned on and off at the spigot and pumps can be turned on and off at the outlet. At the conclusion of decontamination, turn off all utilities. This may be done by protected personnel in the decon corridor or remotely by equipment support. A shower chair may be added for semi-ambulatory patients who are unable to stand unassisted throughout the showering process. Position the chair so that the patient can enter and exit the system safely and the operations team has access on two sides. The patient should ideally be within easy reach of a handheld sprayer, soap, and brush or sponge. Having a walker available can also be useful for patients with mobility problems or to hold on to as they raise their feet to ensure the bottoms of their feet are decontaminated as well. Non-ambulatory patients should be secured on a backboard, stretcher, or other device to aid movement through the decontamination process. In this case, the shower can be set aside until the supine patient is decontaminated inside the collection pool. After the patient is removed from the system, the shower can be replaced in the pool for ambulatory victims or for operations team members conducting self-decontamination. With some types of portable equipment, multiple corridors can be established. If resources are available, these corridors can be mixed and matched to care for ambulatory, semi-ambulatory, and non-ambulatory patients. The same principles of setting up the decon corridor still apply. Utilities and supplies should still be concentrated on the dirty side, and victims will still proceed through the process from the warm end to the cold end. If a decon tent is used, position it on the tarp in a very similar manner to a portable decon shower. The entrance to the tent should open toward the warm end of the decon corridor and exit toward the cold end of the corridor. All utilities should be concentrated on the dirty side. Many decon tents offer independent corridors allowing the simultaneous management of both ambulatory and non-ambulatory victims. The non-ambulatory patient can be placed on a backboard and rolled through the shower using a portable litter conveyor system or series of portable sawhorses. Position collection containers for solid and liquid waste so that a safe and unobstructed work area still exists for those team members in the highest level of personal protective equipment.
Performing decontamination in a fixed facility offers some advantages over portable equipment when it comes to preparation time, but several steps need to be taken before introducing patients into the system. Clear the room of all non-essential equipment, turn on the showers, and adjust the water temperature. Appropriately place solid waste collection containers throughout the area. Turn on the air venting system and test it for function. The decon corridor principle of demarcating a warm and cold end still applies to fixed facilities with one exception. In a facility with a single door, patients and the operations team should enter along one side of the door, the warm side, and exit along the other, the clean side. For semi-ambulatory patients, a chair can be placed in the system. Place brushes and soap in close proximity to the chair. For non-ambulatory patients, place soap and brushes so the operations team has easy access. Gather clean equipment such as backboards, gurneys, cervical collars, and towels and place them outside the decon room near the exit door. Practice decon area setup along with all decontamination skills. The principles behind setting up your decon area and appropriate zones are applicable regardless of the nature of the event, the equipment type, or the number of victims and responding personnel. Keep in mind the critical need to maintain clear separation between the hospital decontamination zone and the hospital post-decontamination zone so that decontamination is as safe and efficient as possible.